So today's lesson is about what you need to do to hook a realistic sky using my method. And it's what you do to the pattern before you get, before you actually start hooking. Okay. So there's a lot of, if you're doing this and then if you're doing that, and if you're doing this, this is what you do kind of a thing. This is not, this is what's so important. This is not the only way to hook a sky. If you hooked a sky and you didn't do it this way, it doesn't mean you did it wrong. Okay. There are many ways to hook a sky. This just happens to be the foolproof method that I use to teach rug hookers who do not consider themselves artists how to hook a very artistic, very realistic, natural looking sky. Okay? So it all comes down to how do you prepare the pattern and get the pattern ready for hooking. Now, the wind, the Sky wool. Of course, I should have grabbed a piece. This is the sky wool. The, this, these just happen to be some damaged pieces. So either I will use them or I'll sell them at a discount. They've got a little bit of stuff in here, and I think it was um, came from the pan when they were processed. So they've got some little colors in there that you don't normally find in a sky. But hooking around that would be so simple. Um, I just can't sell them as perfect. But this is what dip dyed sky looks like, okay? I don't personally dye it anymore. I have a good friend who's here, Kim Hurt, who does that kind of dyeing. And her website is called Because of You, and that's where you can buy this sky. And we'll talk more about this sky on Friday. For now, what we need to do is to divide the sky into four zones, okay? And if you imagine a fourth of this wool, each one of those is a different zone. So we're going to be cutting this wool into four pieces this way, okay? A dip dye is usually cut this way, but we've clearly dyed it this way on purpose, and it's meant to be cut this way. Okay. Like I said, more about this on Friday. So to get the pattern ready, because we're going to divide the wool into four pieces, we need to divide our pattern into four pieces. And I found that there was a lot of confusion on how to adjust it. And usually when I'm in a workshop, I will work with the student and I'll draw their lines in for them because I've divided so many of them that I can do it very quickly. Um, but I thought if you saw several examples, you would be able to do it too. So let's go to the iPad. We have to wake it up. Okay. And this little graphic here is from my book, pine trees, grass, and sky. And imagine that you had a little pattern, just has some ground, it has sky, and it has a pine tree. That's it. That's your whole pattern. What are you going to do with the sky? You're going to take that sky, let me get, let me get a good color. You're going to take that sky and you're going to want to divide it here into four zones. Well, what I typically do is I start and I look for the center of the pattern, which would probably be right around in here somewhere. Then I look at what's above the pattern, what's above that halfway line, what's below that halfway line. Am I using the wool? I have the same amount of wool of both kinds, so I want to have the same amount of area. And this pine tree is actually taking up a little bit of space, not a huge amount. We'll see some examples later on that are a little bit more exaggerated. So I would actually put the halfway point more like here. Okay, I've raised it a little higher because I'm not using 
my sky wall to hook in the area where the pine tree is so I can hook more of the sky, okay? Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this area right here and divide that in half. That was easy. There's nothing in either one of those areas. Simply chop it in half. Then looking below the halfway mark in the zones one and two, there's about the same amount filled in. So if I took this amount and divided that perfectly in half, it would be about there. Well, there's a little bit more of the pine tree in the bottom than there is in the top. Not a whole lot, so I might go a thread or two up. And then I would divide it that way. That gives me my four zones. It gives me a shot at using the wool up the same way. And that one, last one I just did, let me reverse myself on that one. I'm going to go halfway and I'm going to go a little bit below. So if you were looking at that going, hmm, that didn't make sense. You're right, it didn't. <laughs> okay. And I'm going down on this line a little bit below halfway because less of the wool is going to be used in this area. Okay. Let's look at another example. Let's look at this. It's a little sailboat. And we've got the similar kind of thing, and we want to divide this area right here in half. Uh oh, why is it? Let me figure out why I'm not. There we go. So I'm going to take this area right here and divide that in half. And right there is where I would normally draw it. Before I draw it, I'm going to look at the area above that line, and then I'm going to look at the area below that line. Am I using the wool the same, in the same quantity? No, because I need more down below because the sail is bigger down below. So what I'm going to do is come a little bit below the halfway point. Oops and draw my line there. I'm going to do the same thing here. I'm going to take this area, divide it in half. Am I going to use it equally? No. I'm going to move it down a little bit and go that way. This part right, oops, that's my mistake. Hold on. Let me start over on this one. Okay. <laughs> Take two. Let's try this again. Okay, from here to here, we're going to find a halfway point. From there, I'm going to look at what's above and what's below. I am going to be using less sky below because the sail is going to take it up, right? So I can move that up a little bit. Then I've got this area here, and I can divide that in half. I always start with an automatic boom in half. I don't measure it because it's not that important. Um, I just eyeball it, and then I make that adjustment. Am I going to need more one place or another? I can actually use, make the area number one, the first area at the bottom, a little bit bigger because a lot of the sky is going to be used. But I want to fix that because that didn't really look like halfway. That looks a little bit better. And I can go a little bit above and put that there. Then I can look here, go halfway. Which way am I going? I'm going to move it up just a little bit. What usually ends up happening is this zone up here is almost always empty and almost always ends up being a skinnier one compared to the other versions, okay? Because you're going to need more wool because it's more sky, okay? Let me see if there's any comments. Okay, let me flip over to the next um, picture. And while I'm doing that, 
um, who was it? Linda right here. She says, why do you call it window dye? I call that window wool because that's wool that I use to hook windows. And that hooking windows can be a really hard wool to find one that works well. So that's, that's window wool. Okay, so here we go. We got another, another little thing. This one's different in that the horizon you see right here is not straight across. Okay, so what I'm going to do is from here to here is the biggest part of it, right? I'm going to take that line and I'm going to eyeball it and mark that in half. Then I'm going to look at what's below that line, what's above that line. I can hook quite a bit more of that sky using the first two values and less with the last two because the last two have nothing in there to divide it, which also then makes this easy. I'm just simply going to cut that one in half. This one then, if we're going from here to here, I'm going to find about the halfway point and then I look at what would be below that line and what would be above. I'm going to move that up a little bit. So now, if we were perfect at doing this and we could somehow figure out the area that's being hooked by each one of these um, zones, ideally they would all have the same number of square inches. Okay, so we're not doing all that math. Okay, let's try one more. Or actually, I've got one more example after this. Same kind of situation. We've got a varied hill, but we got some things taking up some of that those higher areas that we didn't have before. This area right here is the biggest part. I gotta highlight that. Okay. This area right here is the biggest part. That right there is about halfway. I'm going to take a look at what gets hooked above and below. And in this particular case, I'm going to say it's pretty much even. I've got a couple of things going on. I've got a hill here that's taking up space. But up here, I have a tree that's taking up space. And my house goes almost all the way up to the top. I can't quite figure it out, so I'm going halfway straight across. Then I'm going to take and divide this into half, and then I'm going to take a look at what's going on. Clearly, I can move that line up a little bit because that hill is really going to take up some of that stuff. The house, the space that that takes up is the same in both zones, so it doesn't really matter. So I'm going to adjust it up by what I think the hill is taking up, and it's a gut feel. This part up in here, that's halfway. Do I want to go up or down? It's probably about the same. I'm just going to bring it straight across. So you're going to end up with these spaces that aren't always going to have the an equal amount. And it might not make sense. So I tried to come up with something that I thought would exaggerate a little bit more. So here's a weird little house. Actually, it's kind of scary looking. But if we're dividing this one up, I'm looking for the biggest part, and it's right here. And about half of that would be right there. Based on what's below that section and based on what's above it, I can raise this line up because there's quite a bit of that space being taken up by the house. So I'm going to move it up to, say, here. Now, to divide the upper two, this area right in through here, that's about halfway. But I have this much of the house taking up space, so I'm going to move that up. Down below, from here to here, I'm going to figure out halfway is about there. And it's about the same based on the house, except this dips down 
down through here quite a bit more. So I'm going to need a little bit more wool for that. So I'm actually going to move that up just slightly. And then this would give us our zones. The other thing that I think is important is on your pattern, extend these lines and write your numbers in and do that on all on both sides. Once you start hooking and you get all that hooking done in this middle part, it's going to be hard to find those lines. But if you have it so it comes all the way out to the outside of your rug, you'll be able to sort of guess, am I in a three zone or am I in the four zone? Okay. Okay, so let me go back to here and... So Kathy is saying, do you hook it straight across or use a puzzle piece style? For my method, I use neither, <laughs> okay? It's a new method. It, well, not new method. I've been teaching it for 20 years, but that's what I'm going to cover on Friday, okay? And it's basically the title of that video is Stop Hooking Straight Lines. It's definitely not straight lines. Straight lines are for brick and for roofing. That's it, okay? You don't want to use it. So do you stitch your, your sky straight across from left to right? No. Yeah, Kim, what's wrong with using calculus? Never mind. Kim does that little jab because Kim is a math wizard and a math teacher. Do I have an example of a sky, a rug with sky? I absolutely do. I thought I got it out. I didn't. Hold on. The village of Hemberville, which you can kind of see there in my finger going the right way, right there. <laughs> that is hooked using that method. What's nice about this method is that you use the same size piece of wool no matter what shape your sky is. So your shape can be long and skinny. It could be tall and high. It doesn't matter. You don't need a special kind of wool to meet, match your specific pattern. You can use this method no matter what. I don't need that camera, so let's get that out of the way. So here is a little pattern that I did. I think this pattern is called Jasmine's Garden. And this is a teaching example, so it's not even complete. And I did it that way on purpose so that you could see what the difference is. And let me see, did I make my numbers? kind of see it even though I've got this up but you can kind of see how I, I continue the lines out and draw the numbers in it makes it easier to find it once you're getting ready to um, to do the hooking and I think for this I am going to since I can let's bring this little camera around and let's let's do this Okay. So here, what I did with this one is that would have been right here, would have probably have been the lowest part of the sky. And then I would have looked for the halfway point. And it's a little bit higher, mainly because of all this stuff going on. So it's a little bit higher. Once I get that, and now I have to split this in half, that tree pretty evenly fills up the space. So I would have put that right in the center of that. And then from here down, if this was my halfway point, or my end point, this is halfway, clearly I'm not using much sky down below. So I would have moved this up probably pretty substantially. 
in order to draw that line through there. Does that make sense? So Melissa is asking, could you show the window wool? So this is window wool, and they're all going to be slightly different. Um, what you get is a piece from four different spot dyes. And even though I dye them exactly the same way, they don't always come out the same way. They've never come out that different. <laughs> but each, each value gets slightly darker as you're working along. Let me get rid of it. Whoop, there, went away on its own. And then there's the darkest one. So you can pick and choose what value you need for your windows. And that's important because when you are hooking a house, particularly a house with windows, I don't know if it can show this area down in through here, that first section of windows are all done very, very darkly because the eave is there and it's casting a shadow on it. Let me see how close I can get that camera zoomed in for you. Oops. Right now that's the closest I can do, but when I post this as a replay, inside the rug hooking journey, I'll post a close-up picture of that house so that you can see how the window wall was used in that house. Let me put myself back to where I was. Looks about right. And Diana says, love window wall. It really does work. Um... Rennie says, with all that wool, so you freeze thaw it all every year to avoid moths? No. It's just like COVID. I'm careful about what I bring in. Okay? I don't bring in anything, anything that could jeopardize. Anything that could jeopardize what I'm doing gets washed. Um, and, and just so that nothing comes in with little carrier moths on it. So Linda says, I'm totally lost. Is this method to determine how much wool is needed? No. Or how to use the different values? Yes. How to use the different values. So you've got this piece of wool. You could just randomly start pulling stuff out and on your own figure out what value goes where. But you've got to pay attention. We like to rug hook in groups. We like to have fun. I like to make things easy for you so that you don't mess it up, right? So tomorrow I'll have an example. Yes, Kim, I need you to send me that um, sky that you hooked in a stupor the other day and send it to me. Um, this makes it simple. And it gives you guidelines on where you put the wool. Now, this piece of wool and another piece of sky wool are going to be slightly different. That's on purpose. That is by design. We dye them that way on purpose. And what happens then is you need to cut a bunch of it and then put it in and um, make sure it ends up in the right place. It all looks the same once it's cut. And if you don't have it organized, you're not going to get that beautiful shading. You're not going to get that beautiful shading. Pat is saying, when hooking a rug that is more muted in color, wouldn't the dyed sky wool be too bright? Yes. And if you're doing something that is more muted, you're probably doing a primitive piece, and you probably don't want the sky style of sky anyways, okay? This would be for something that's realistic, okay? And remember, blue is the first color that's going to fade, and it's the first color on the planet that's going to fade. 
blue cars, blue paint, blue clothing. I don't care what it is. It's just the nature of the pigments that we have available to us that make blue. They're going to fade first. So it is a bit over dyed with intense color because you're going to lose it. The village of Pemberville has faded. It's a 20 year old rug and it has faded. And so you want to start with something with a little oomph in it so that no matter what, you can keep part of it. Now I over process my blue dye. When I am dyeing blue wool, it gets extra acid, it gets extra long cooking, it sits in the pot and cools down. It, I give it every possibility for it to stick, but you can only do so much with what you got. Uh, is number four darkest at the bottom? No, and we'll cover this more tomorrow. Number four, the darkest, is at the top. And if you're unsure, make sure you between now and Friday, when I do the other lesson, look at skies. Now, if you look at today's sky, you're not going to see anything. At least here in Northwest Ohio, it's like cotton balls up there. It's 100% clouds. You're not going to be able to see sky. But look for that wonderful clear day and really look take a minute, you know, and just look at the sky. If you have to set an alarm, you know, for two o'clock in the afternoon, look at the sky. And that alarm goes off, you hear it on your phone, you go outside and you look, because sometimes that's what we need. We need a two by four across the head for us to stop and look. And really, really look. Look at the color that's way down at the horizon. And then now look at the color that's way up at the top. It is a lot darker up there than it is at the horizon. And that has to do with how much air you're looking through. Okay, and we're probably not going to get too scientific with that even on Friday. Um, but there are reasons for that. Okay. Yeah, Nancy says, I have a rug, it's 40 years old, and the sky is now almost totally white. Yeah, that's what happens. Yeah, and it's blue. On your sky rug sample, is that a hooked border around it or just fabric? No, this is, um, I use this as an example for what the Canadians call a show finish. This is, this is sashing, okay? So this is how I make a pillow. I sew the sashing on and then hook up to it. And then when I'm ready to make a pillow out of it, I just take my backing fabric. Let me get rid of that comment. Oh, and it always goes away just when I need it. I then take my backing fabric and I line it up here and I go to the sewing machine and sew, sew, super simple. Super easy way to make a pillow. If you need more details on my website, simply put pillow in the search box and it'll show you. But what you can also do then is take that sashing, turn it around to the other side and then stitch it down. Okay. And that creates a show finish. Um, what's nice about this finish is where's the knife fold edge? Nowhere. This is one finish where your backing stays perfectly flat the entire time. So there is no knife fold edge. Uh, Heather is asking, is there any type of finish you can spray on the finished rug to preserve color? No. Your best bet is going to be prevention. Just like with moss, your best bet is prevention. Do not hang the rug up in a place where it gets direct sunlight. Ideally, don't have it facing like this wall here, this direction going this way, that's north. So I'm getting the softest light through those windows. I never get sunrise or sunset, and I'll never get sunlight directly through these windows unless something really bad happens. <laughs> okay, So that one never sees direct sunlight. My windows have a tinting on them, and if yours don't, I understand. 
My windows in my old house didn't. But there's a film that you can buy at, I think I got it at Lowe's or Home Depot, and it's called Gila, G-I-L-A. And I take those and put that on the window. And I was doing a color fastness test in a window where I had put that film and nothing faded. And I expected it to fade, but it didn't. So it wasn't until I realized that I had put that film on the window, that's why nothing was faded. So once I got it into another window without a coating, then it faded as expected. So Heather says something like UV sprays on artwork. I mean, Heather, you can do whatever you want with yours. I would never do anything like that because it's not reversible. And if it speeds up the decay, and I don't know if there have been tests on it on fabric. So that would be the only things that I would look into. I just make sure that my stuff and, and the stuff I dye nowadays, I cook even longer and dye a deeper blue than what I used for the sky there. Um, someday I will have to rehook that sky. And I know that. And I know that that's just going to be one of those things that, you know, 10, 15 years from now, that'll be like my parting, you know, shot is I will have to rehook the sky in the village of Pemberville to keep it blue because it makes me kind of sad that it's losing, you know, this, this, that wonderful luscious blue. In fact, it's a dye recipe that I've nicknamed Pemberville sky because we are flat as a rock here. We have no mountains, no nothing. We are basically drained swampland, and which makes for very fertile farm fields, and it makes for wide open vistas. So I can see the sky from here to here, and I see everything in between. And when you get that glorious blue sky day, there's nothing like that. So that's the sky that I always use. Okay. So that's the prep that you have to do for getting ready to hook a realistic sky. Friday, we are not having a lesson on Wednesday. Um, I don't know what day I made that decision and first announced it, but I'm cutting a hole in the week and I'm taking Wednesday and Thursdays back. Um, there's some work that I have to get done. So no hook in on Thursday and no live lesson on Wednesday. But the rest of the schedule is intact. If you go to the homepage, you'll see the information there. Um, and uh, what I'll cover on Friday will be the color, how to rip the sky wool, and how to hook it and how to hook a sky without straight lines. Because if you hook a sky with straight lines, that's all your eye ends up seeing, is you see those straight lines. First off, people look at it as a background, so they'll often go larger in cut size, which I think is wrong, because the bigger the loop size, the more you look at the loops themselves. I don't want you to see the loops themselves. I want you just to see background sky and you don't even pay it, your brain doesn't even register it. It's so natural looking that you everything is as it should be, okay? And go smaller in cut size and avoid rows like this. We're going to be talking the F word, which is fingering, and I'm going to show you how to do that without having to control it. And it just happens automatically, which is a great, great difference. Um, oh, boy, the comments just jumped. Magbus is saying, I know what you mean about beautiful blue skies. I remember the beautiful blue sky growing up in Venezuela. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's something about that. Um, and, and that's what I'm always trying to duplicate. And that's why it's such an intense blue. But remember, this looks big here. But once you start hooking it, 
only a small amount of that dark blue is going to show up at the top because that's all open and empty. The rest of it has stuff filled in in front of it. So as far as how big it is this way, that dark blue ends up being the smallest because that's almost always empty is the very top one. What number is the window wool? It is no number. If you go to my shop and you go and you find window wool, you're going to find um, a product there. I think it shows up. It's going to have zero dollars on it and it has a link. And if it doesn't, I'm going to check it right after this and make sure it should have a link to Kim's site um, at Because of You because Kim is dying my sky wool. I showed her everything that I do with sky wool and she's doing it the same exact way that I do it. Um, her business is more dyed wool. Mine is more as is. So it was a perfect compliment and easy to pass that on to her. And what number is the window wool? It just says window wool. <laughs> it's kind of like my antique background. If you go to my shop and you go to wool, you're going to see window wool right there. So I hope you'll come back. I did put a link in the show notes of this video that will take you to Friday's lesson. Um, Friday's lesson, remember Friday's lessons, the replays are always reserved for inside the rug cooking journey. So you can watch it live on Friday, but you won't be finding it like at six o'clock on Friday because it'll be tucked away inside the rug cooking journey by that time. So that's it, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. And I will see some of you, hopefully, at the hook-in on Tuesday, tomorrow at four o'clock. And then after that will be what? The Friday lesson. We'll do the Friday lesson, which will be about the direction of hooking skies, and then the Saturday hook-in. So that's it, everybody. Bye for now.